Hello, and welcome to you all. Happy August 3rd. Good morning to my West Coast people and good afternoon to my Mountain Central and East Coast friends. Uh, we're so glad to have you here today. Welcome to the fifth installment of the Cultural Policy Action Lab. Uh, just a little bit of orientation to the space. Captions are enabled. Q&A will happen throughout the session. So in the chat, you can uh, uh, offer any questions that you have for our presenters today. Um, my name is Randy Ingstrom. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, I am uh, the principal and co-founder of Third Way Creative and a co-designer of this program, along with my uh, incredible partners in crime, Jen Cole from uh, PNCA and Willamette University and Estrella Escaline from the Santa Fe Art Institute uh, with generous support from our friends at Grantmakers in the Arts. And today, a special treat, our co-host of today's session is Nadia Alokta, the VP of Programs for GIA. And I have to say a conspirator and catalyst for this program. Uh, we're really excited to have you all with us today. Um, and so please do engage, please do utilize the chat. And um, with that, I'd like to introduce Nadia, invite her to the stage to, to explain a little bit about what the Cultural Policy Action Lab is. Nadia, take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, Jeff, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, welcome, folks. If this is um, your first time joining us, really excited if you're back for some more Cultural Policy Action Lab Learning Series content. Um, as you may know, the Cultural Policy Action Lab and Learning Series is a leadership and development, a professional development community of practice program for public sector workers who are seeking to advance racial equity through arts and culture and through public policy, a really important intersection. Um, and we are, in the next slide, you'll see we're on a, an eight-part learning series, and we're currently on the fifth session, arts education. We're on the uh, second half here, um, and really excited to talk about um, arts education and creative youth development with some really fantastic speakers today, which my wonderful co-host Randy will intro now. Um, it is it is uh, legitimately my pleasure to introduce some of my favorite humans uh, in 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 the world and in the field. Uh, Jeff Poulin from Creative Generation, who's going to carry a, a lot of the content today. My former colleague and dear friend Ashraf Hasham from the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture, and uh, my dear friend Alberto Mejia from NALAC. National Association of Latino Arts and Culture. Um, and we're gonna have a, a, a conversation. We're really excited to, to have you all here. Um, we like to, you can go to the next slide, Jeff. We have been uh, trying to be more intentional about how we do our land acknowledgement. If you joined us here before, this, this won't be new to you, but we aim to get from uh, statements to action, as is the Cultural Policy Action Lab. So um, we like to offer that even in this time of COVID-19, when we're physically distanced and dispersed across the US, we're still in COVID-19, we would like to recognize that we're grounded uh, and connected to Grant Makers in the Arts, which is located on Lenape land in what is now New York City. This acknowledgement is meant to uh, recognize the history and legacy that colonialism uh, of that colonialism that displaced the first peoples there and where we are speaking to you here from today. We are all connected to sanctioned and unsanctioned policies and continue to benefit from that legacy through our compensation to facilitate this session today. In addition to shifting the policy uh, to policy in the public sector, which is why we're here today, uh, a beginning step in this work is to dismantle our own internal and structural colonialism beyond this territory acknowledgement uh, and, and to support these organizations and these tribes that are working for indigenous communities through resource and financial donations. So for information uh, about the organizations um, that you can support, we are going to put those uh, links in the chat, the NDN Collective, Native Women Lead, First Peoples Fund, and Native Arts and Cultures Foundation. We encourage you to learn more about their work, uh, to consider investing in their practice, and to move from, uh, from, from acknowledgements to action uh, in service of our Indigenous partners. Um, with that, it is my great pleasure to turn the uh, virtual mic over um, to Mr. Jeff Poulin. You could, you'll get a snapshot of um, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hello, uh, everybody, and thank you so much for that introduction um, to everyone uh, on the production team at GIA and Randy uh, for segueing us. Um, the objectives uh, for today's time together are to discuss trends in public and private funding strategies for arts and cultural education, 
to understand youth perspectives about cross-sectoral creative work and its impacts, and lastly, to examine the response of arts and cultural education programs through the pandemics of 2020 to today. Um, here in this session, um, we just would love to start by saying that, you know, we believe um, in all of the things that, that Randy was just saying in taking um, restorative, liberatory, and justice-oriented approaches, um, particularly towards public policy, and recognizing that there are um, impacts within the arts uh, that have been historically um, fostering community wellness, racial equity, civic narrative, and belonging, that we believe that this work is done by training civic leaders to center artists, change makers, and community self-determination in the imagination and implementation of public policy. And further, we believe that arts and cultural and uh, creative education is a human right, and that this is achieved through the coordinated efforts between civic education and cultural ecosystems to align public policy and funding to enable young creatives to cultivate their creativity at the most local level. So um, what and who are we? Uh, as introduced, my name is Jeff Poulin. I'm the founder and managing director of Creative Generation. Creative Generation is a global collective of artists and educators, researchers, administrators, storytellers, and activists who collaborate with young creatives and those who cultivate their creativity to take local actions towards global changes in pursuit of a more just world. As a collective, we're relatively new. Um, we began in April of 2019 and currently sit at about 21 members of our collective in six nations and 16 time zones. And ultimately our work is focused on this um, hyper-local approach to understanding global phenomena at the intersection of arts and culture, education, youth development, and social change. So it's really our distinct pleasure to be here. Um, we at Creative Generation also acknowledge uh, the Indigenous peoples who have stewarded the lands that we operate on. I myself am currently sitting on Piscataway lands in so-called Frederick, Maryland, and honor the elders past, present, and emerging who caretake for this land, specifically their wish in, um, instead of making land acknowledgements, taking those local actions. So today I will be tending to my garden, um, which has produced much of a salad that will be dinner tonight. Um, creative Generation ultimately believes that youth create change, and we work together to kind of foster all of that belief um, in a number of projects that I hope to share with you today, beginning at that hyper-theoretical level and working towards those um, local contextual cues that we as cultural policymakers can engage in. So many of you, and I see some very familiar faces here uh, in the session today, may know that I spent many years uh, traveling the country working to advance uh, public policies at the federal, state, and local level towards equitable access to arts education. Um, and in a moment of vulnerability, I'll just share to say that, you know, I propagated some beliefs um, that I do take responsibility for that helped steer the narrative that maybe was not entirely accurate or potentially misingenuous towards the type of outcomes of arts and cultural education. And on this day here on March 24th, 2018, the day that young people, particularly young theater makers, musicians, and creatives led one of the largest student marches on Washington since the times of Martin Luther King, the March for Our Lives. This was a moment where we saw creatives using their theater and music and art to change the narrative and take control of the type of public discourse they wish to see. And it caused me to question, you know, why are we promoting arts education? Why do we talk about it in terms of our public education system, out of school time infrastructure and broader conversations about youth development? Is it because we really care about higher test scores or college attrition rates? Or is it that we believe that creativity, particularly that creativity which is applied towards social context by young people, can actually change our communities and therefore change the world? So I began asking some questions with colleagues all around the world that 
began in four phases of research. First, we examined how we as a field of practice describe the work and, and its outcomes, the work that artists and educators and community organizations are doing to cultivate creativity in the next generation. And we found that it was just that. It was a lot of lip service. It was somewhat problematic. It advanced objectives that gatekeepers cared about, not actual young people, their families or communities. Second, we thought deeply about how artists and educators and community activists most effectively cultivate the creative capabilities of the next generation. We spent time visiting with 30 programs in 24 nations to understand not only how they were implementing their work, but how they were most effective. In phase three, throughout 2020, we examined how young people can be supported in their pursuit of what we called creative social transformation. We thought about how adults, such as those artists, educators, or community organization leaders can be supported in their work, partnering with young people. And lastly, we thought deeply about how young people and adults who are committed to this work can navigate those very strict systems like cultural funding or education policy um, that impact their work. And lastly, in the last year or so, we've examined the shifts in pedagogies, organizational practices, public policies, and leadership pathways that cultivate creativity and catalyze social transformation. When it comes to the work, and I'm gonna use that word a lot, we've begun to understand that what we refer to is this act of social transformation, which is a concept that has its origins in the global South, particularly indigenous Latin American communities, that refers to processes of change within institutionalized relationships, norms, hierarchies, and values over time. It's a process by which the individuals within communities are actively transforming themselves. And what we witnessed all around the globe is that this same act of social transformation is often enhanced and amplified with creativity. But it begs the question, what, you know, what is creative here? And when looking through the lens of youth development and young people, we actually stumbled upon some definitions that actually come from the consumer marketing realm that once was used to uh, help sell tickets to festivals and art shows, that it describes this intergenerational group of people who share creative capabilities, such as creative thinking, cultural consciousness, connectivity, and a concern for community or citizenship. This term, the creative generation or Gen C, is thought to make up the vocabulary that we can use in order to understand this phenomena of creative social transformation, and in fact, better understand those supports that envelop it. The first is around creative thinking, which is the ability, uh, particularly for young people, to identify challenges and to employ creativity to envision solutions. Cultural consciousness is a process. The first is an ability. The second is a process of understanding one's own cultural identity and developing a respect for and often a participation within other diverse cultures within one's community. Then we have connectivity, which is a commitment to remaining engaged with peer or social groups, regardless of time or location through virtual or interpersonal meets, which strikes ever more true in these COVID days. And last is this concept of citizenship or concern for community, which is an act of servant leadership, regardless of means to strengthen the communities to which one belongs. So equipped with this new vocabulary, we're able to actually look through different lenses using an educational futures perspective to understand a new type of theory of change for the field of arts education. This groundwork that we can build from that looks beyond just teaching to the test or fighting for traditional Eurocentric prioritized Western cultures within the art sector. We believe that we can create, cultivate creative capabilities in young people through those four capabilities that catalyze acts of creative social transformation, which contribute to thriving communities and a more just world which are often tracked by measuring youth development, community development metrics, or even international development through the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So I share all of this with you today because 
we at Creative Generation believe that this is the promise that we've made to young people to cultivate their creativity and allow them to have pathways, not stifling that creativity, but to employ it to envision and develop the world that they want to see. And this isn't actually just a belief. This has its roots in public policy and international doctrine. Going back to um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in the middle of the, of the 20th century, reaffirmed with the Convention of the Rights and the Child in the mid 90s, in 1989, excuse me, and implemented throughout the 90s around the world, and codified into public policies through international bodies like UNESCO, the United Nations Education, Scientific and Cultural Organization in both um, 2006 and 2010, and here in the United States, influenced by the Reinvesting in Arts Education Report from the Obama administration and codified into law by the 2015 Every Student Succeeds Act. This promise of arts and cultural education as a manifestation of cultural development, creative education, and more, traces its lineage back to a conversation about human rights. So we as practitioners and local policymakers, be it through de facto policy and funding or explicit policy and accepted legislation, have a promise to deliver on. In fact, we might be held accountable to this declaration of human rights or the rights of every child to creatively express themselves through education. What's most interesting, though, is that we in the United States have fallen down at literally every step. Did we ratify the Convention of the Rights in the Child like every other nation in the world? No. Have we signed on to these roadmaps or agendas to advance arts education? No. Did every state effectively implement the Every Student Succeeds Act and its 12 arts-friendly provisions? No. It's all actually left up to the most local context, to local decision makers, to municipal policies, and to partnerships between cultural organizations and systems of education. So let's talk about cultural policy. In this conversation, we could debate what cultural policy is. Let's just put a pin in that for now and accept what has been widely accepted around the world as the four dimensions of cultural policy, supporting artists, supporting arts organizations, supporting cultural diplomacy and arts and culture within education systems. If we do that, let's further broaden out our perspective, which this work comes from some research we did with several universities in uh, in Turkey and Korea um, that came to understand that together the intangible cultural heritage programs, those that have to do with cultural diversity and cultural heritage, plus formal education systems, arts education programs in K-12 schools, and also those out-of-school time creative youth development programs all contribute to the whole development of the arts, cultural, and creative capabilities of young people and the expression of their cultural identity, particularly through artistic learning. So think in your community, if you can name those ICH programs for young people that deal in cultural heritage, arts education programs within schools or out of school time CYD programs. If you can name those, keep those in your mind as we continue to progress through the next couple of slides. At the most federal level here in the United States, we actually have some great connectivity. In fact, there's something that exists called the Interagency Working Group on Youth. Most people know them by their product, youth.gov, which is a clearinghouse for different practices, federally funded projects from all of these different agencies. And you'll notice are some of our very favorite ones like the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the National Science Foundation, uh, the Department of Education are amongst these places. But did you know that through this interagency work that we have a series of arts programs that are funded by the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention within the Department of Justice? Or perhaps there's actually a number of programs, arts programs that are funded um, through the Department of Health and Human Services, particularly during the pandemic times. This interagency work happens at the federal level. Now, I've been to some of these meetings. They're, they're quite boring. They sit in a room in one of these big federal buildings or on Zoom, and they talk about really big macro issues about connectivity between releasing funds and transferring monies and all of that kind of stuff. 
But at the end of the day, we actually have this interconnectedness that's happening that a lot of people don't understand. And because of the very active nature of the National Endowment for the Arts, the arts are a part of the conversation amongst most of these agencies. So I wanna share with you a little bit of grounding, taking it from that hyper-federal level to this hyper-local level through um, some youth perspectives about topics that we care about. In 2020, through a, a collaboration with Artplace America, our team at Creative Generation um, that involved myself, our former director of research and knowledge, Jordan Campbell, and several of our um, staff, including Andre Solomon, former colleague Kathleen Hill, and others, engaged in a project that examined youth perspectives at the intersection of community development and arts and cultural education. We began with supporting teams of young people and their teaching artist counterparts in several cities across the country um, and asked them to be documentarians and analysts about the impact of their creative work on community development. One great revelation from this is across the board, these youth researchers concluded that when grappling with their impact over time, they noticed that when they tried to do things alone, they had some impact, certainly, as youth artists. When they worked together with their peers, they had more impact. But when they worked in community, and I'll stop there, not in community meaning in the community, but in community, in collegial, transformative relationships with others, they had the most, if not exponential, impact in their work. And they elevated this conclusion by interviewing their peers, talking with other community organizations, people that were involved in the program from the executive director to teaching artists, and really understanding that resonating impact of their work was beyond just the art making, but it was actually in the community building of the projects itself. When we asked them to describe the impact they did so by discussing a couple of things that almost directly correlate to that report from the Rand Corporation from like 1994, Gifts of the Muse. If you remember that report talked about intrinsic impact versus instrumental impact, private impact versus public impact. We heard all of those same terms coming from these young people, but they added a third dimension, a Z axis that thought about deeply the impact on people and the impact on place. And what we heard is that these young creatives were describing the inputs of their programs, like the types of intent that were formed by actually describing the impacts on the back end, right? So they thought really deeply about what outcomes do we want? Is it for our own enjoyment, something deeply that we just feel? Or is it to achieve some instrumental goal? Are we actually thinking deeply about the experiences? Is this something that is private to those participating or really public and outward towards other people? And what type of community are we engaging with? That with a physical space or those with a collective of people? And as they grappled more and more with this, they were able to draw those connections to different sectors that their work intersected with. They thought about those three lenses in terms of the mental and physical well-being or racial justice or food and agriculture in certain circumstances and how the artistic practices they were engaging with could say, amplify some great messages in an instrumental way about education reform, or perhaps were deeply, deeply personal in personal healing about racial justice. And further, when we asked about how that impact rippled, so like who they impacted in these transformational programs that worked cross-sectorally, what was described in different artifacts from a choreographed dance piece to spoken word to visual art was uh, represented here. And now this is a amalgamation of all of these different art forms represented visually on this slide, but across the board, across all nine different examples, 
we saw that there was a deeply transformative experience in the co-creation process between young creatives and adult artists. That had a, an immediate impact on the friends or the activists and artists and other mentors, families and caregivers that encircled these youth. Then they had a community impact outside of that interpersonal connection on cultural organizations or youth serving organizations, arts and cultural programs, schools and so forth. And beyond that, it had an impact that was highly public with the general public, with government agencies, community leaders, other stakeholders, the research community that rippled it out even further. Probably a little biased because we were researchers in the mix. But one example I'll give is from a program called Dancing Grounds and Dance for Social Change in New Orleans, Louisiana, where their coach, in this case, her name was Coach Jess, worked with these young people, in this case, Akila Tony. And you'll see Akila in a video clip that I'll play in a second. But what was most transformative here is that their bond, their co-creation process of a dance performance. Of course, that had impact through the entirety of the creation process of what Akila brought home to her family, discussed with her friends that were either in the dance troupe or not, and really were able to connect to other artists or activists that were engaged in that creative process. Further, it rippled out. This one program held a site-specific dance festival, brought in other programs that were in the creative youth development space, the arts and cultural space, dance specifically, the schools. And then beyond that, they invited community decision makers to this dance festival. They had representatives from the zoning board, from the housing authority, from their community organizations, Tulane University and others that were part of a discussion about gentrification and displacement which was the theme they explored in their dance pieces. So as we looked across all of these examples, young people specifically named the impacts that they observed in their communities, giving us, the adults, those decision makers, funders, cultural policy makers, new language to think about in the design of our studies, our programs, our public policies, our funding portfolios. They believed that in their work, they were nourishing creativity and cultivating agency in young people. They thought that they were nurturing sustainable and responsive communities. They thought that they were building strong interpersonal and collective bonds. They believed that they were fostering health, well being, and belonging. They thought that they were catalyzing intergenerational cultural continuity. They thought that they were enabling access to welcoming, safe, and healthy spaces. They were rethinking community, civic, and cultural institutions. And lastly, they believed that they were developing systems of collective decision-making. So I asked you to think in your world a little bit about programs in the cultural heritage, arts education, or creative youth development spaces. Did these jive with those types of programs? Do you think that they might believe their impacts align with these? And are you currently assessing those impacts in whatever capacity you might do so through these lenses or through others that might perpetuate problematic systems? So I wanna go back to that project as you think about those questions. This was a youth-led policy-focused creative project called Reclaiming Our Home. It was a site-specific festival in New Orleans, Louisiana, centered on gentrification and displacement. It was organized by Dancing Grounds Uprising Teen Company called Dance for Social Change. I'm gonna stop sharing, so please bear with me as I flip over to the promotional piece that they put forward to give you a little taste of what they created to drive a discourse about gentrification and displacement in New Orleans, Louisiana. Come and get it, come and get it, come and get it. 
We can make space for you. We raise property values. We push out the locals. We push out the poor. We push out the black. Come and watch this new spectacle. We offer you the new mistral. Beads, beignets, wooden, we have it all. Feast on savory gumbo, succulent spicy crawfish, jumpin' jambalaya. Feast on the culture, folks. City for sale, city for sale, city for sale, folks. Hot city, come and get it. Come and get it, come and get it, come and get it. It's like we're raising succulents every day in New Orleans, folks. Space is limited. Move in now. So with that as our context, we've talked a little bit about the underpinning theory of, of um, arts education as a human right. We've thought a little bit about perspectives of how young people are reframing their own applied creativity as developed in cultural heritage, arts education, or creative youth development programs. Now I want us to take a little bit of a look uh, under the hood, if you will, of two different cities, Seattle and Austin, to think about the structures. At the beginning, I, I talked about navigating those strict systems. So let's look at those systems that exist in two different places. So first, I would like to turn the microphone or the, the stage, the virtual stage over uh, to my colleague Ashraf Hasham, who unfortunately couldn't be with us here today, um, but we were able to have a conversation uh, just two days ago that we recorded so that you can get a good idea of what's actually happening in terms of public policy that supports this type of highly integrated arts and cultural education through their public policies. So here now, uh, let's hear from Ashraf Hasham and hosted by me two days ago. to the stage, Ashraf Hasham, coming to us from Seattle. Um, Ashraf, thanks so much for being here. I know you couldn't be here live, but it is great to have your voice uh, in this space. So um, we're taking sort of a break in looking at our whole conversation about arts and culture and cultural policy and youth development to actually look inward towards uh, an example of a city, in this case, the city of Seattle. So first, can you just talk to us a little bit recognizing the multi-dimensional nature of you as a human, uh, these two perspectives that you bring, one as the former executive director of a youth arts program, and now mm -hmm. as a municipal leader within the city government. Yeah, so thank you so much, Jeff, and thank you to the Cultural Policy Action Lab for having uh, me, and uh, really excited to, to talk more about the, these intersecting identities and certainly intersecting areas of, of magic, I feel like um, I keep saying. So we're going to talk about it in, in a magical perspective. So one, uh, so in terms of context, yes, um, I came to the city of Seattle and its Office of Arts and Culture as the youth arts manager from uh, directly on the heels of my two years as executive director of the Vera Project. The Vera Project, for those who don't know, is a all ages music and art space at the Seattle Center campus in which um, it's volunteer led and youth led. Uh, and uh, it is a creative youth development organization that really is a concert venue. It's a concert venue that's run by young people and it is um, it benefited from actually starting because of advocacy to the city of Seattle saying, we don't have any concert venues for young people. Um, and specifically for folks who don't drink alcohol or there is no alcohol in these venues. Um, so how do we just still have access to live music? There was some footloose laws in Seattle at the time when Vera was founded. Um, so that um, that ended up, those footloose laws get it got, got gone away through advocacy from the Vera Project to the city of Seattle. And the city of Seattle supported Vera from its very beginning um, to now. There is dedicated funding for the city of Seattle, from the city of Seattle to the Vera Project. And um, in, in looking at the opportunity that was left um, by the amazing Lara Davis, who, who had uh, run the Creative Advantage and the work that the city of Seattle did in arts education and creative youth development with primarily Seattle Public Schools as the partner. Um, I was just so blessed and and continue to um, continue to loud the foundation Lara set um, for this work to happen at the city. Um, upon her departure, I was able to come in and taking that amazing foundation, build a team that uh, effectively does 
all of that work in three spaces, creative youth development in the out of school space, in school arts education through the creative advantage, and then career connected learning, connecting young people to careers in the arts and specifically getting them paid for their brilliance uh, and creativity and staying in the city ideally as a result. And so the creative advantage, as I mentioned, is kind of the jewel on top of all of this work with, uh, with young people, with youth arts and with the city of Seattle. Creative advantage is a, it is a um, now 10 plus year long effort to be able to, or 15 plus year long effort really, to be able to um, get every Seattle public school student equitable access to arts education. And really what that means is a predictable sequential arts education uh, from K through 12 um, guaranteed by the city of Seattle's Office of Arts and Culture in which the city of Seattle's Office of Arts and Culture in this collective impact partnership with Seattle Public Schools pays for community-based teaching artists, community-based organizations coming into classrooms and then working with young people who likely look just like them. Um, and so it adds diversity to the classroom and adds cultural relevance to the classroom. It adds opportunities to integrate arts and other uh, subjects uh, in, the, in the classroom. And it allows for uh, there to be extra capacity uh, just in general for both professional development for those teachers uh, and educators and the teaching artists, and of course, for young people to be able to gain access to arts, which is um, a, a necessary for for a well-rounded young person and a whole young person. So that is kind of the context, the creative advantage being the sort of link between the Vera project and the city in a way that has evolved from the way that it was founded back in the day. And that's how the context in which I entered the city, right? The creative advantage was the main thing that we were stewarding. Luckily, the staff uh, at the city, shout out to Tina Lapadula specifically, had been carrying the creative advantage quite a bit from um, the time that Lara was around. And so, um, yeah, and so I guess I'll pause there and, and uh, wait for the next It sounds question. like there's, there's like tremendous efforts that are happening. So I want to like peel back the onion a little bit and think specifically about how the, the cultural policies, right, those, those formal or informal policies, maybe explicit policy or funding measures that come from the city's Office of Arts and Culture have both um, either instigated or maybe catalyzed these intertwined sort of youth focused and culturally specific programs, projects, initiatives. So give us sort of the under the hood description of what's going on in the cultural policy landscape. Yeah, well, um, there's been really amazing work done to integrate arts and culture into city policy as much as we can from the last 10 years of efforts uh, in our being around and being consistent and leading really around race and social justice as our main uh, driver of the work that we do. And luckily, the city has also moved in that same way the last 10 plus years. Uh, and luckily, also, um, our, our funding for our department has grown because um, the admissions tax, which funds the office, has also grown in the percentage in which it's been able to fund our office. Um, admissions taxes for uh, attractions, movies, the Great Wheel, Space Needle, all that kind of stuff. There is a percentage in which comes to our office. Um, and that has grown. Um, obviously, COVID has uh, has a little bit deteriorated that growth and has, has shocked it a little bit. But um, there is still a ton that has come from that. Um, some examples um, come from the very close collaboration that our office has with uh, many, many, many city departments. Every All departments from Office of Economic Development to off the Department of Education and Early Learning, which of course works with uh, the Creative Advantage quite a bit. Um, everything from Department of Neighborhoods uh, all the way to the Office of, um, of Sustainability and the Environment, right? Just like all over around and specifically in the Department of Transportation as well as Office of Civil Rights, we actually have embedded staff members um, in which they, they are part-time arts, part-time Office of Civil Rights, part-time arts, part-time Seattle Department of Transportation as the artist in residence or, uh, or whatever. So there's actually built-in opportunities for collaboration to happen and built-in staff in which they can say, oh, wait, arts has a solution for this. We don't have to actually go around um, this many turns to get to where we need to go. We can get there closer um, with one sort of motion by simply partnering with arts. One, uh, one salient example of this for this moment is um, just the other day, Department of, Department of Neighborhoods was doing some outreach to the West Seattle community around uh, the Link Light Rail extension that's happening there. They wanted to talk to young people and get some ideas about how they would be affected by this. It's really Link Light Rail will only really come to 
come to fruition in 15 years, right? Like the amount of time where young people will become regular people. Um, of course, we here think that young people are regular people beyond that, though. Um, so, of course, they wanted to engage young people in West Seattle, what that would look like. They, they said, hey, do you have any ideas? And I said, we have a ton of teaching artists on the Creative Advantage Arts roster, Community Arts Partner roster. They are vetted uh, through a panel process at the city. So they are uh, they're just our recommendations in general for all sorts of things, including um, teaching artists and community engagement. So why don't you take that list? Um, let me know how many hours you're looking for community engagement. I can pay for that based on some uh, some budget that I have um, laying around. And so that is a, a partnership that can sort of blossom just from step one. Um, you want to work with young people? Great. I got I got some funding for you to do that, right? Nothing speaks, speaks more to collaboration across the city than somebody helping fund uh, something that is good for community, right? And so um, that's the type of work that we've been able to happen. Another example around like how it shows up for community maybe a little bit more is grant making. I'm now the Partnerships Education Grants Manager at the office, um, and that's my, my, my work has grown through COVID. Um, part of the work that I now get to do is work with um, our grant making team. And luckily, there's been amazing grant making work that has been as collaborative in the cultural policy space. So an example is Office of Economic Development gives out career connected learning grants, connecting um, essentially the economic vitality of the city of Seattle, its businesses, to the young people who will eventually be staffing those businesses. And creative industries was named as one key sector uh, of the grant. So we saw creative youth development organizations that are already teaching young people how to prepare themselves for the next economy and using their creativity to get there, getting funded by these, these efforts and at larger uh, amounts than arts could fund them, than our, our City of our, Seattle Office of Arts and Culture could fund them. Similarly with our Human Services Department, they have a youth success RFP that really goes towards young people who are facing all sorts of um, incredibly um, life-changing things like houselessness or um, or being uh, in a situation in which uh, one has to uh, go through foster homes, right, or, or other sort of situations. Uh, a, a number of organizations who provide creative youth development um, services were also awarded here because the work that they do surpasses simply arts and culture. It also gets into young people's thriving in society and also mitigating um, uh, just circumstances that come their way. Um, so those are two examples of how non arts and culture departments actually give organizations uh, from the arts and culture sector funding specifically youth based and then um, there's another program I just want to finish off with called creative equity fund, which is um, a number of community based foundations in Seattle coming together to fund organizations that use arts and culture as a tool to get towards liberation racial equity in general. And so there's organizations like the Pacific Islander Health Board of Washington that got funding um, from this collaborative uh, funding source of which Seattle Office of Arts and Culture does participate. In addition to Arts Fund, uh, the uh, Sherry and Les Baylor Family Foundation, Macklemore's Camp, or Culture, or County Arts Agency, among many others. And so you'll, you'll see also organizations that are simply using arts and culture tools to advance our general shared goals, right, as a society. Um, and um, I really credit the office's leadership, uh, past and present, to um, to really make those known and to unabashedly and unapologetically bring arts and culture into the fold as a, a true bona fide strategy. Um, and I'll yeah. pause there. Yeah, that sounds, that's really interesting because I think what I'm hearing you say is it's all about sort of the shared objective yes. and being able to identify those things. And then the um, more almost social aspect of collaboration, it's not necessarily like the MOU that we then celebrate and, <laughs> you know, and, and put in the newspaper, but instead it's really that deep strategic embedding of strategy. Embedding. Uh, I think that that is something that's really interesting. So as we sort of begin to look towards the future, we've been looking towards the past, you know, what do you think the future of, of cultural policy um, through municipal leadership, for example, in arts and culture, in support of young people, what can that or should that be looking like? 
That's a great question. And, and honestly, it depends on the appetite of whoever the, the executive is, right? That is to say the mayor or the city council um, or otherwise, right? How much do they want to value young people and use that use youth as part of their strategy to build a better city, um, utilize their their brilliance and their, and their assets as, as such, right? Um, and luckily, we've had uh, mayors who do care a ton about youth, right? And so um, luckily, that hasn't been very hard to do. In fact, there's plenty of opportunities for young people to thrive in the city including going to community college for for free um, through taxpayer dollars. Um, I do think, though, to your point, um, it is collaboration. It's working together. It is tearing down any sort of false silos that exist between departments. There's many folks who are doing, at the city of Seattle, who are doing the, the right thing and folks who um, are collaborating to make sure that there aren't uh, work that is being duplicated, right? In such a big city, uh, the city of Seattle has 12,000 employees, right? There's got to be some people doing the similar work that somebody else in a different department, right? But um, I think the work from now on and here or forth is let's make sure everybody's talking to each other and let's make sure that there's opportunities built in to reflect and to reiterate. And and that that creative process that I just described, I think is is going to naturally be part of um, the future. And I, I guess I hope it continues to be part of what we think is built in into um, into the future, right, is working together with all departments that work with youth, any sort of touching youth uh, in, in their in their proximity. Um, from the fire department, right, who runs a youth program, all the way to um, all the way to a Department of Education Early Learning, which is really where, where um, as far as um, folks from the external, they think that's the only department that that hangs out with youth, right? That's not quite the case. Um, and I think we just have to be better at telling that story, right, and then encouraging folks to keep us accountable. Oh, great. So that's a little bit from Ashraf Hasham in the city of Seattle. And the things I would just underscore to continue driving our conversation forward is the deep embedding of strategy towards shared objectives. And a thing that he didn't say, but a word that I'll interject is a humility of the arts and cultural sector to not own the arts, but instead to democratize it and share it as one of those deeply embedded strategies. So now I'd like to invite my uh, colleague here for this webinar, Alberto, to join us to talk a little bit about the city of Austin. So uh, welcome, Alberto. Thanks so much for being here. Um, the first question in the same vein uh, that I asked Ashraf uh, before, you are a multi-dimensional person who wears multiple hats. Um, I've known you in a couple of different roles, working with the youth arts organization, working um, within the greater context of the city of Austin, and then also now working at a national <clears throat> service organization. So kind of outline for us, uh, build the foundation of the perspectives that you bring to this conversation about cultural policy for youth development. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, everybody, it's a pleasure to be with you really quick. My name is Alberto Mejia. I am currently deputy director at NALAC, he, him pronouns. I am a light-skinned Chicano uh, uh, Latinx male wearing a blue shirt and there's a teal green curtain behind me. I'm in a coffee shop and it's a pleasure to be here with y'all. Um, coming to you from Austin, Texas, which is the lands of the Tonkawa, Lipan Apache and a lot of other folks that there's always been a sort of a cross ground, crossing ground of indigeneity and indigenous people. So yeah, my, 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 how I'm informed by my attitudes and beliefs and I guess practices in terms of youth focused work is really was forged first as a hip hop artist who became a teaching artist actually in the Pacific Northwest, you know, where um, I met Randy, I, I worked at Youngstown uh, and really I think met some young people that are still in my life, you know, when I was fairly young myself as a teaching artist who are, are just tremendous folks and tremendous community members. So from teaching artistry, uh, kind of bouncing back and forth between arts administration and social services. So case management based in schools, uh, intertwining cultural arts practice, uh, the, the facilitation I was doing, uh, and then also engaging in sort of community-based cultural arts spaces and arts administration at places like Youngstown Cultural Arts Center. Um, and, and from there, I you know went to grad school and, and I kind of think, I, sh I thought I was gonna grow up to be Jeff looking at what you just presented. It's incredible, man, it's really incredible. And just uh, hats off to you. Like, I think I was there at some of this ideas just kind of coming out 
uh, what you thought you would do. And oh my goodness, what a, what a gift to our field. And I think helping us all be a little more global and, and deep in our thinking about what youth work is in this country. Thank you and hats off to you. So in grad school, I kind of thought I would go, go that route, but I ended up really uh, starting to get into arts administration in places like Youngstown, where I was the director for a short time before moving to Austin, Texas, uh, where I worked in, um, for the city of Austin first as a, a manager of a culture arts space called the Dowerty Arts Center. It's a funky old naval facility that was run down, uh, beloved by the community, and actually an intersection a lot of a lot of Austin's BIPOC communities before they had dedicated cultural spaces of their own, you know, produced by the city. So um, I worked really hard to revitalize that in, in a funky old building with a lot of spirit and love. And then uh, jumped over to Creative Action, uh, working in, in their community-based programs, uh, and eventually landing at the city, uh, crossing over into sort of, um, you know, public arts funding, and then finally now NALAC. I just wanted to sort of paint that picture as far as my experience, because not talking about what's been consistent through that experience. I think that the young people I started my career with and the community members, I think really educated me in the importance of power sharing. Um, power sharing, testing models, and having a consciousness about what you're doing as you do it, right? And that comes from strong facilitation. That comes from operationalizing um, people to have a voice in a given space when you're doing something, you know? Uh, thinking back to the days when I was working with Randy on the FEAST program, which was a, a you know the a food based uh, local effort for young people to sort of reclaim, for lack of better words, food sovereignty and access, um, and and that's still going today. But in that place, you know, testing models and 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 sharing and going over what's happening in real time with young people, and you know, in my other in my other roles with the intended recipients of the program, and then I'd say the the other thing is that it's. Uh, it's about honoring young people and operate, operationalizing their participation as full members of a given community. Uh, that's, that's really, I think, what's been consistent in the values you know, over time in, in the various roles I've had. And I think that um, what, I, what I'm really excited about, Jeff, is what you presented, those sort of the four Cs you presented. I think it was really great that you sort of delineated attributes of you know, strong youth creative practice versus outcomes, right? Because I feel like probably for years, myself included, a lot of us are like, if the outcomes aren't happening, what is going on? And then we put that downward pressure on the young people and they probably lose interest and do something else with their time. And I think um, in that work and seeing you sort of um, codify that in, in this moment, I think that's what we were always grasping for. We we're always grasping for, you know, activating those four C's that you, that you mentioned and striving for those impacts, right? Uh, throughout, throughout the career that I've had. Um, I also think I'll, before you ask the next question, I'm super stoked about your list of, when you presented that list of what young people thought they were accomplishing through their creative practice and in community, I was like, that is a recipe for maybe NALAC to create uh, uh, maybe a youth focused fund in the future. I was like, there's, there's the criteria, there's the recipe, you know, whipping that into a grant program real quick. So I'll stop there and uh, welcome your next question. Well, thank you. And I think that's a fantastic idea. And I think we have about uh, 30 attendees here that could also maybe pool their funds for something like that. Uh, just saying. Um, so uh, from your from those multiple perspectives um, that that you bring really across different, you know, states working in youth focused programs, um, different types of um, social services that are embedded with the arts, plus working, you know, with the city and now with this National Art Service Organization. Talk a little bit about how you have seen cultural policy be that de facto policy through funding or explicit policy through um, city measures um, be that catalyst for this sort of interdisciplinary cross-sector intertwined I think is the word that you used that type of project or initiative or body of work. Thank you for that so I'll start with um, thinking back to uh, you know, my time at Creative Action and other, you know, youth, well, that was a, a, a specifically a creative youth development, you know, mantle that they had. And I thought about when I jumped on board, uh, taking the, the there's th there was three youth focused programs or collectives, really. Um, there was a film based, a film based collective, a theater based and a public art or sort of mural. And I remember jumping in and uh, having previous connections with the city, sort of connecting the dots between like, 
offices that really don't do much with use, like the Department of Transportation, um, like uh, the, sorry, the, the, the Department of Public Works, you know, people that deal with public right away. And so through relationships, we cooked up these interventions that were really awesome, awesome experience for the young people to connect and see an impact in the, in the, in, in the public in a, a highly visible right away, you know, an incredible mural. Um, and I think I'm personally really proud of those moments, but I think, and maybe this is what I'll come to is I think a, a, a restraint, even on really well healed resource, you know, um, youth arts uh, development or creative youth development on profits, they are still doing so much arts and in their resource generation, right? That even a rad program that starts to sort of hint at the things you're talking about, Jeff, like arts as an impact in the, the fabric of the city, arts as an impact on society. Um, they're dealing with seven other grants that might be a lot, a lot more straight, uh, you know, really sort of um, blunt, right? Like those education outcomes uh, and, and et cetera. And so I think what, unfortunately, you know, I think those programs are still going, but when I look back, I, I wonder if you, you almost need like a civic champion in the city a civic champion and, and someone who has a conception and a drive for this as a social, a social impact to keep that going, right? They're fantastic projects, don't get me wrong, but I, I think that those type of projects and promising things that sort of get to the, what you were presenting are sometimes um, circumvented by the daily grind of, uh, in, in some of these you know, creative youth development environments. And I imagine that's even more the case with the less resources that they have, right? Making the connection between the program that they, if it's a single program run at someone's cool garage, if it's a, a an emerging program, or if it's a, 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 a you know a, a creative youth development nonprofit with big badass offices, they all have to work with that arts and stuff, and it creates. Uh, I think it's tough sometimes to have the um, the mindset and the imagination to incorporate maybe some of the the, the things that you're talking about, uh, Jeff. So and then so I'll transition now to talk about the city, and. When I went over to the city, I kind of had the charge of catalyzing, organizing um, a, a racial and social equity overhaul to a model that had existed for many, many years in the city of Austin. And like a lot of things in Texas and Austin, it was kind of had roots in sort of a um, somewhat nepotistic old boy kind of politics. Um, and at that point in time, uh, when I arrived in 2014 and took the job at, at the city, it had only been four or five years since we had um, district based government versus at large. Right, so this informs everything in terms of uh, cultural policy and how dollars flow. For the city, it happened to be, you know, hotel occupancy taxes. So jumping into this role, working with this team, and doing a certain way for a long time, there was lots of resistance and misunderstanding and suspicion. I'd say, especially from the groups that had been used to receiving consistent funds for many years, uh, and and the larger the funds, I think, the higher the suspicion, frankly, of some of these um, efforts toward racial and social equity. Um, I think that, you know, throughout that experience, I eventually left the city, but I was actually looking back at the draft guidelines that they passed. And this, this isn't a direct correlation with, you know, youth, you know, youth focused arts uh, organizations, but I think that focus on racial social equity created venues for more opportunity for people to get to do youth focused work other than the ones that are super successful, right? Because there's a lot of high barriers to entry. You know, um, it's, it's, it's a risky sometimes having, you know, working with young people for liability reasons. Um, you, the arts and factor, you have to apply for all these different resources. So what happens to the individual artist? How do they interface with a young person? Where's the resources? How is it stewarded? What about a creative business that might want to get into the mix, right? And, and has the capability, maybe even the jobs for the young, people, young person to engage in the arts. Um, the, the city wasn't paying attention to that. And I'm glad to say that looking at the new guidelines, there's, uh, you know, the re requirement of fiscal sponsorship has been waived or is now being questioned. Individual artists can now access those funds. There's a, there's a direct focus on linking BIPOC uh, artists with a long history in the city uh, with the right development and support and fundraising to become institutional as many other white led organizations have. So I know I'm kind of veering off, but I think the lesson of this is that, you know, we, we leaned into those things um, and in all, in all transparency, we didn't have a, a youth focus objective in that. And in all transparency, I feel bad about that. It was an overwhelming exercise. However, now that we've got that going, we can get more granular, 
now that there's more venues and access, we can think about the specific needs of someone trying to work with youth in a creative context because they're 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 different and completely right uh, than interfacing with adults or professionals in each of those programs. So I think I think that's what it's about. And then even looking at NALAC, we've had um, a lot of focus. Well, I'll pause there because I'll leave this one for the future. Question. Yeah, I was gonna say yeah. So my you sort of started to segue there, but I in some of those reflections um, and sort of what I'm hearing where I want to pull out this thread about sort of the, the burden, right, that is put on these cultural organizations doing cross-sectoral work that have to like learn the different languages of like all of those things and, and navigate that space. So as you start to think about what maybe we could or, or sh should do, where do you really vision cultural policy going that can <clears throat> better enable this cross-sectoral, youth-focused, arts-based work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, so I think um, it's really, when I think about, maybe I'll start with the, the organizations themselves, right? The, the younger, the organizations that have carved a path, white-led or not, that have found success, that have the full-fledged grant writing teams, you know, it's time to share resources and power with the organizations down the street with someone who's been doing the work potentially even longer than your organization, working with young people committed, asking a deep question about yourself about how you can be available, share power and resources with them. That's, I think that's a critical question. And, um, you know, even at Creative Action, we were, when, 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 when I was there, I remember, you know, Austin has, everyone knows, been sort of like the preeminent example of intense rapid displacement, you know, and uh, an increased cost of living that bears down on these communities and the very young people organizations that Creative Action is, tr is trying to serve, right? So before it's too late for your organization, you know, those relationships will sustain you and sustain the young people in place. You know, there was a moment where we were like, wow, all the young people are served, are moving out to the, the, the exo suburbs of Austin and the programs get wider and wider, you know? And if you have the right relationships, in place, you can continue to serve, hopefully, the people you want to serve and also speak out for the things that will keep them in place. And I think you and your presentation, I think it's also probably really incredibly, if, if, if youth serving organizations and programs don't have some sort of strategy explicit about place, it's probably overdue. I mean, the housing crisis is spreading everywhere. And it's only a matter of time if it hasn't hit you yet when you start to see the young people you serve move away, their families. Uh, you know, not being able to stay. That's not to say that you don't you don't have to be all things to everybody, but there should be some sort of place-based strategy or conception, you know, in your work. And if that involves partnering with government, with other local nonprofits, it's probably in the best interest of a strong youth-serving organization to do so. Um, and then uh, I, I think now going to like national service organizations like NALAC, you know, we've learned a lot even within the 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 tensions and the beauty of the Latinx diaspora. What are we doing to better serve Afro-Latino folks, uh, Black Latinx folks, Indigenous Latinx folks, disabled Latinx folks? And today, I think I'm, I'm even more inspired to think about the unique needs of young people and, and young people that are also starting, you know, programs or running programs. You know, it's not unheard of that, you know, 17 and 18 and 19 year olds are doing some incredible you know, practices in community too. So I'm just kind of called to think about how maybe culturally specific intermediaries such as ours explicitly serve young people and ask those tough questions that, you know, you listed in your things we think we're doing. And, and, I, and, I, and I hope that this global vision, and I'm really, I think it was really good that you named that some of the things that inform the, the work of Creative Generation have, uh, have inspiration for where the global South conceptualizes creativity and community. Like that's, that's exactly what we need to be doing. We need to stop the nuns, like, and then the, that correlation with the ex, whatever exceptionalism that America has as a hangup where they don't buy onto like global things, like whatever that is, we got a dispense of that. It's not serving us, it's not serving the young people, you know? And so at the federal level, maybe at, the, uh, at our, our, our regional art service organizations, I hope that they're digesting the, the research that you have produced with your team, you know, uh, Jeff, because. I think it, it, it can present so much opportunity for us to be more explicit and strategic about how we resource young people in, in uh, up to speed with our global counterparts, but you know, um, taking, just taking care of our own communities. Well, 
Thank you for that. I think that there's a, a number of gems. There's so many ideas. I was started making a list and I've had to stop. I'm gonna have to go back to the recording. Um, so thank you for that. But Alberto, hang tight. We're gonna add one more lens before we go into our conversation. Um, and as I do that, simply because you uh, you sort of referenced it, um, we did some, uh, as we begin to think about the pandemic, which is what we haven't actually uh, layered on here yet. Um, we've looked sort of at our examples um, before and through the pandemic, but I do want to um, have a conversation about the impact of the pandemic. Um, the the report that I just put in the chat um, was actually conducted, it was a quick response survey in March 2020 about how these creative youth development arts and cultural education programs um, felt that funders could respond in this time that um, sort of speaks to the point, Alberta, that you were just making. So that's not part of this presentation, but um, fun reading nonetheless. So um, over the course of 2020, um, we looked uh, specifically at the uh, pandemics, plural, um, that emerged um, that impacted arts and cultural education programs. And so before we close out today or go into our conversation, I really want to put the lens of how our, our cities, um, municipalities, and um, programs are, that are youth serving arts-based programs really grappled with the pandemics. And you'll notice I said pandemics, plural. Um, so in March uh, to April 2020, um, Creative Generation um, issued that response survey, that fast response survey that I just mentioned um, about how policy and funding could respond um, to the impacts of COVID-19 and catalyzed a global campaign called Keep Making Art. Um, and then from March to September, um, we did two different projects. The first was in partnership with our friends over at Wolf Brown, where we observed 41 creative youth development programs and their response to the multiple pandemics that were identified. Um, and that produced a series of articles that were published in Arts Education Policy Review. We also conducted a review of these good practices that were identified on a global scale by UNESCO um, and shared during uh, International Arts Education Week in May. And then from July to November, uh, we did um, uh, through the Art Place study, we specifically worked with those programs to examine the impact of those multiple pandemics um, or the crises of 2020, as we called them. Um, and then lastly, we continued to identify what these leadership actions are um, and how they kind of move us towards a future um, uh, to mitigate future crises. So to share um, these arts and cultural education programs, both from here in the United States and all around the world, um, articulated the ongoing pandemics that impacted their work. Um, the first was the COVID-19 global health crisis, particularly the social and political failures um, that disproportionately uh, impacted um, different uh, populations within our societies that were largely disenfranchised um, going into that pandemic. Um, the racial violence, uh, of course, on the heels of the murders of folks like Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, um, we saw that this was largely a generational harm um, that resulted from systemic racism and the, how programs were able to grapple with both um, the violence at the hands of police and vigilantes um, in their communities. Uh, economic inequality, particularly the widening economic um, gap that we saw over the course of um, those several years and the reliance on capitalism as an unstable system. Uh, that there was political divisiveness, particularly in relation to the lead up to the 2020 presidential election here in the United States and the rise of other nationalistic or authoritarian political regimes around the world. And lastly, the climate crisis. Um, literally, as we were doing some of these studies, Australia was on fire. Um, and so the physical and mental stress um, that is caused from the decades of political neglect and overconsumption um, that has disproportionately affected parts of our world like the global south. However, in all of these pandemics, it was really interesting to be in conversation with these many programs. Um, this graphic here, um, generously created by our friends over at uh, GIA, but ultimately um, represents a finding from the study we conducted with Wolf Brown um, that looked at the ways in which uh, those 41 arts and cultural education programs around the United States were responding to the pandemics, to all of those pandemics, not just COVID-19. What we found is that programs, you know, they were trucking along in March uh, 2020, operating in their comfort zone. They knew what they did well. They were excellent at cultivating creativity and young people in their community. And then when that pandemic uh, happened in March 2020 and the subsequent pandemics that followed, really folks were launched outside of that comfort zone into that next realm, the fear and uncertainty zone. 
where they're asking really important deep questions, not knowing what's going on. What are your young people safe? When will we be able to open the doors? Can we continue to pay our staffs? And through those questions, programs naturally emerged into what we named the insight and learning zone. And I should mention that this model roughly aligns to one that was widely understood about risk taking. We saw this a lot during the pandemic. And in the insight and learning zone, we really saw the emergence of two pathways of programs. Some of them harnessed those insights and learnings um, and moved towards new opportunities. Some, about 40% or so, fought against that change and fought tooth and nail to get back to their comfort zone where they sort of short circuited. And what we found is that that 60% or so that moved towards those, uh, the opportunity zone to the opportunity scenario is we found that they were actually sustaining those new opportunities. They were in fact doing things like differentiating their income streams, not being reliant on one set of grants. They were forming new and different partnerships that supported things like community health um, through their arts-based programs. They were finally grappling with food instability, for example, and opening up public pantries to the families of the young people that they served. But this actually gave us a lens to really think about um, how programs were asking those big questions, harnessing their own insights through that creative social transformation, perhaps, that we talked about, and applying towards sort of new and different futures. And one example that we saw was um, with a program in uh, Detroit, the Mosaic Youth Theater of Detroit. So I'm gonna actually pause and I want us to conclude this session um, to think about the big questions that these young people are asking of us, the adults, the municipal decision makers, and perhaps view it as a challenge. What insights do you gain? And what way can we act like those 60% of programs that harness those insights from tough conversations, from a disruption from these multitude of pandemics to ultimately create the vision of the world that we want to see? Is this an emergency? Or as these young people say, is it an emergence? Shh. I miss you. This is not a drill. We're in a state of emergency. 70 days, four extensions. Did I mention 94,000 plus just in Michigan? This it's is a state, state of emergency. emergency. See, we're 14% of the population, but 40% of those impacted. These are people. There are faces to these stats, and this is this. This is matters. Is a state of emergency. See, education's been upended, schools closed, and the inner city ones don't have what's needed to address what history has cemented. This is a state of emergence. See, it's so much bigger than a digital divide, meals, support systems, holistic wellness, and I can't even fully articulate what happens to one's spirit when nearly everything you love is taken away in an instant. This is not a drill. A. Can't embrace my family. Graduation ain't the same virtually. Parade birthday, Zoom memorials. My heart. This is not a drill. Don't tell me State. what I shouldn't grieve. I don't need you to determine validity for me. This is not a drill. Oh, emergence. emergence. drill. Love, love rain down. We, we need, need more people talking about what's really going on. We need, need more tables. We We're not satisfied need, with the silent need, seat at yours. No need, more distractions need, or elusive need, leaders padding scores. We need, we need, we need. This, this is a state is of emergency. A drill. No more talking, deciding about us without need, us. No more speaking for us. We've got our own voices. More people listening instead of being so quick to speak. My pause is for the breath I need to make it through this week. It is your invitation to give us your pseudo fix. We've been know what's needed. Believe it, we've seen it. We need more than a carefully scripted statement. The hashtag we stand in solidarity and a promise for our lives. And righteous indignation will proceed because this is not a drill. We're
So we're going to go ahead and stop there to honor everyone's time and to save about 15 minutes for a conversation uh, to be had. I would highly encourage you to watch the full eight minutes. It is one of the most uh, brilliant and poignant pieces um, of youth artwork that I have seen recently. So um, to take uh, the advice of some of those young people, it is time uh, for me to stop speaking into the void and to listen. So Randy, I'm gonna turn it back over to you uh, to facilitate uh, our last uh, minutes together. Thank you, Jeff. Um, incredible job, so much content. We did our best to capture everything in the chat and send as many links as we could. Uh, all of the presenters were sort of a fire hose of, of incredible content. So this is being recorded. I mentioned that in the chat, it will live uh, on the Grantmakers in the Arts Cultural Policy Action Lab site. So you can come back and watch it again. I think I'm gonna come back and watch it again. Um, so just thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Alberto. Thank you, Ashraf, wherever Ashraf is somewhere somewhere here in Seattle. Um, really, really powerful. And thanks for you know really challenging our conversations around public policy to, to be focused on transformation versus transaction. I think that's the, that is the fork in the road that the pandemic put in front of us and the racial justice reckoning and the climate crisis and uh, all the things you mentioned. Um, there's a couple of questions in the Q&A that I'd love to start with. Um, if other folks have questions, please feel free to add them. We've got about 15 minutes for discussion. Um, Emily Garvey uh, submitted a question that asked, are there existing fiscal maps of youth arts and culture funding for cities akin to fiscal maps of youth services generally? And she offered an example of one for out of school times in San Antonio. So uh, any any way you want to address that, either either Jeff or Alberto? Uh, well, I will defer. Alberto, do you have a, a specific example from a city where I can kind of give the national overview? I don't have a specific example from the city, so go on ahead okay. with the national. That overview. is great. So, um, so I I love the topic of mapping. It is something that I equally um, get great joy out of, and also uh, want to light my hair on fire uh, about um, because I think it can be done really well and done not great. Um, there has been a really wonderful mapping that has occurred in sort of two circumstances on a national level. Um, one, there has been an effort um, uh, underway um, by several independent organizations, um, the Arts Education Data Project, as well as uh, Parliament Data, which is used to be called Ingenuity um, in Chicago, that have mapped um, the relationships, not exactly the flow of dollars, but the relationships between school entities, cultural organizations, programs, and resources um, that have occurred. Um, some in school, um, the Arts Education Data Project, for example, looks at um, student performance, as well as allocated resources through public funds in the K-12 system. Uh, the other um, that is uh, done through Ingenuity Parliament Data um, looks at sort of a matching between cultural institutions and organizations and the infusion of dollars to sort of meet needs. Um, as far as fiscal mapping regarding opportunity, which is how I understand um, how those work, um, they have been done um, in certain places, but I don't think that they've actually standardized on the same way that K-12 data has been done. Um, the one uh, answer that I often got in my former role at a national arts service organization was how much money is spent on arts education. Um, and we actually did uh, some analysis to figure out what that would take to answer and ultimately found that it would be more expensive to answer the question than it would be for the dollars that actually go to programs. Um, that said though, we know that particularly in the pandemic, we've seen the largest investments in arts education through some of the largest investments in arts and culture and education in all time. Um, so starting in 1965, we saw public investment in education, the um, dollars that came out of um, the ESSER funds and other sort of acronyms that you can trace back to pandemic relief um, were the largest public investment in education um, inside of one fell swoop. And we've seen the benefit of that in the short term for arts education, but it's created sort of a huge clip. So this sort of mapping um, that's referenced with the one example, I think is something that would be advantageous to, um, to invest in because I don't think that there is an accounting in a lot of circumstances of say, dollars that end up in the hands of arts programs through juvenile justice funds or through um, housing or other types of um, pools of, of funding. Um, but I also beg the question, let's not spend our resources on mapping that 
if that money could actually just go in the hands of those programs. To cite Ashraf's example, how do you really equate for some of those embedded people that are advancing arts education um, in other public agencies? Um, you know, do we really want to spend our time counting uh, the pens that they use in a year, um, or do we want to just put those hands, uh, that money, in the hands of young creatives tackling social issues in our communities? Just to thank you. A question from Sahara. Um, I hope I'm saying that right. Um, about um, uh, Nadia offered some information about this in the in the Q and A um, written response, but I'd be curious how the how the two of you think about lifelong learning. Right. There's K-12 and but then there's arts education in a, in a broader context. What she wrote was, I really appreciate all the discussion of youth focused programming and the way that arts education addresses youth concerns, specifically in relation to activism and social change. But I'm wondering how you envision arts education and public policy affecting all ages within a community. In my organization, we frequently use the term lifelong learning to characterize programming and campaigns that address broader age groups within a community. How can we enact social change through arts education that centers lifelong learning? I'll take that on real quick. I think um, I'm glad that was brought up because I think, you know, in my own culture and practices, like naming the whole range of ages in a given community and, and uplifting them is really important, right? Another thing that we could learn more from from the global south in terms of intergenerational practice. And I think just to just to reemphasize in Jeff's presentation, he I think unequivocally said that programs that have intergenerational, stronger intergenerational relationships, he didn't specify the age of the adults are the most successful, the most, you know, the higher retention. So clear, you know, clearly it's important, but I think if I, I don't mean to, how do, I'm trying to think about how to say this in a kind way, like lifelong learning to a young person right now, it's, it's critical. And I know that as a, as a grown person, however, like um, I'm thinking about the institutional failures that these young people have witnessed and are um, being victimized by, you know, the, I have a I have a 20 year old younger brother. Uh, he's Afro Latino, and he's living with me, trying to you know reintegrate back into school after the pandemic. And the other day we we're driving, and he said, "Yeah, our 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 generation's dream is just thinking that we could maybe go, buy a house with another friend." Like, and I was like, "Oh my God," you know. Like, so when we talk about lifelong learning and wanting to be inclusive across the age spectrum, let's also be I think considerate of the unique circumstances facing young people at this moment in time, the economic phenomena, the, the, the failures of so, of so many institutions that, you know, maybe some of us took for granted. And I think that has to be thought about. So, you know, in that lifelong learning, what is the work that is going to be explicitly done for young people to restore uh, a sense of reverence, you know, and respect maybe for the lifelong learning. But like, I think, you know, doing the healing work necessary and healing is being used a lot right now. And I think I've seen some people have a different response to the notion of healing in these in this work, but healing is not an abstract. Healing is critical to restore little concepts like pluralism and democracy. <laughs> like it has to be really thought of, it has to be intentional, you know? Um, and it is possible, even if you're like focused on a, passing an instrument uh, down to a young person, that work is the same work, you know, that, that presence you have in their life, it, it, it can build that pathway for them to be masterful in their practice. But it can also be that build their pathway to like, you know, believe in society and be invested, you know, um, and invested in um, and thriving a person, you know. So I'll leave it there. Yeah, I I, I um, thumbs up everything that Alberto just shared. Um, the two things that I would add to that is I think there is a a risk, and we've seen this in a number of um, major cultural institutions um, in the 2000s, of really gearing towards lifelong learning and not specifically naming the unique um, the unique circumstances around children and youth. Um, if you sort of compare and contrast, which you can also just read the paper about it, um, my comfort zone in learning is papers, sorry, uh, academic. I know that is not for everybody, but um, there's a really wonderful work looking at the um, cultural aspects of both the Declaration of Human Rights, which is for everybody, and the Convention of the Rights and the Child that specifically enumerate rights of children um, and the unique development of young people. And um, I think that we need to think of it as a both and, but not just merge education and youth development in lifelong learning, um, because uh, specifically like the development of one's cultural identity um, happens at a very, very early age. Um, and that is something that we need to consider in youth development. Um, secondly though, um, 
across the board, the infrastructures, if you think about hiring practices of teaching artists, space allocation, you know, these like really programmatic aspects of cultural institutions and youth serving organizations, they are often very uh, relevant to lifelong learning. Um, if you are hiring teaching artists <laughs> to work with early childhood folks, there's much of the same infrastructure that can be applied to um, to our, our senior population, our um, you know uh, parents and families. Um, there's something that uh, has come out uh, or a kind of a notion that has come out of some of the work at Carnegie Hall that really actually looks at the family unit, um, caregivers and young people together as learning together. Um, I think it's, uh, you'll have to correct me uh, if I'm wrong, but I believe it's the Lullaby Project that looks at formerly incarcerated mothers and um, and their young children and how sort of music education can be, uh, to Alberto's point, really healing, restorative, and liberatory for both. Um, and that how, and the bond that is created to reflect what some of our youth researchers said, um, that's created intergenerationally is something that is ultra important and something that because of the um, educational industrial complex have over compartmentalized and lost what is natural to humans, which is that we learn and grow together across ages. Um, so that is sort of me just kind of waxing a little poetic there, but I think that there's a lot of evidence um, that does support lifelong learning um, in this conversation about arts education. Thank you both for that. Um, uh, I've, I have one more question for you, which will probably take us to time. But before I did, I wanted to put a plug in for our next Cultural Policy Action Lab, where we'll be joined by Claire Rice from the Illinois Arts Alliance and Julia Rodriguez from the uh, Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, talking about uh, creative workforce development. And um, Alberto was talking about what about individual artists, uh, what about individual artists and creative businesses? We have sort of an underdeveloped infrastructure to support creative workers as workers, artists as labor. So that's going to be the whole topic, August 17th, also my birthday. Um, same bat time, same bat channel. Um, Claire and Julio are, are wonderful. We're really looking forward to having them. Um, and I think it builds off this conversation because we're talking about career connected learning. We're talking about um, how we're, we're developing social and emotional strength for young people to be able to navigate the world. And I have a question um, for, for both of you. Um, so uh, uh, Ashraf offered a lot of great examples that we developed at the Office of Arts and Culture, these shared employees, this intersectional uh, practice. Jeff, you, you brought up, you had that whole slide of all the departments that work at youth, with, within youth.gov. Uh, in a conversation with uh, Dr. Maria Rosario Jackson last week, she was talking about an, a commitment she has with the NEA around arts in all, and how we how we more explicitly intersect art, artistic practice and cultural practice across sectors. And the issue that she named in that conversation was that's no one's job. You have wonderful people like Alberto, Alberto and Ashraf in these uh, civic institutions and these public sector agencies, and they're running their programs. They're doing the daily grind that Alberto was talking about. How are there ways that we can explore that capacity or create a network around that practice? Because it seems like the person making those connections, that relational work um, is so key to being able to do this uh, cross-sector work successfully and really do that sort of arts in all um, approach. Mm -hmm. So I'll just start in with, um, so at Creative Generation in that, um, I didn't get into this, but I can now. So in the initial study back in 2019, it was all theory. And then we pissed off a bunch of people, which one funder had some great insight to fund us to take it to practice. And we looked at 30 programs across 24 countries and found that regardless of the political or um, contextual circumstance, that every program felt in some way that their practice was stagnating because they lacked the common vocabulary to work cross-sectorally and didn't have, because they didn't have the same vocabulary, they weren't finding peers. So people who do this type of work often don't have the vernacular to fully represent like the full breadth of what they do at these intersections. Thus, they don't find peers. Thus, they're once really innovative practice kind of stagnates because it's tiring to do that hustle alone. So I think, Randy, you're really on to something in forming a community of people who are those translators, who can sort of flex the different vocabularies um, to navigate these spaces. But I also go back to, again, the initial finding 
of, of that study, which was our systems also have a responsibility to not just stagnate and do what they've always done and be responsive. So if there really is this wealth of arts embedded strategies that are advancing youth development in cities, remove some of the silly restrictions, you know, provide opportunity for people to work in the ways that they are naturally working. Our practice is far and away beyond our funding streams and our public policies. It's time to perhaps update some of those things to uh, reflect what's actually happening on the ground in the lives of young people. Thank you. Alberto, final word? That's such, a, that's such an excellent question, Randy. It's like in this in this world where <laughs> I'm like, I, you know, I love the question, but I'm like, how do we not do a meeting for another meeting <laughs> at the same time, right? It's real talk. It's, 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 it's such a provocative question. Um, and I, I, I'm, you know, I don't feel qualified necessarily to kind of think about, think on an answer, but, you know, like having, um, I think it's elevating culture and importance in a community will make space for this conversation to happen, right? So I think now I'm wondering, like, how do systems, how do systems create spaces for these dialogues and identify champions and support them? And, and then how do we how do we bring these people forward and 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 at, and at what level you know should, is it it's not it's clearly not just like the local arts commission right that's not it <laughs> that's part of it but that's not it so you know i think i would like to close though kind of thinking about how so much you know so much frameworks and concepts can just be on, honestly overwhelming on any person no matter how smart you are how much information you can absorb and i think it's uh, i i want to apologize for not beginning this in a spirit of gratitude because there's probably people on this call that have worked in the arts longer than me, that have served community longer than me, that have you know fostered generations of positive change and, and um, creative experiences for young people. So you know we can't see each other, but I think I need to thank you first and foremost, and say that you know these these things are just gifts that are presented to each other, um, and um, you know by no means for me, at least speaking for myself, my my way is not the way, and I and I think we can produce new cultural knowledge together. And I think, especially in the environment that we're in, there, a spirit of approaching things in a spirit of kindness and acknowledgement. You know, it's just an a, a experience yesterday with a major funder and several significant BIPOC arts leaders. And someone spoke up and was like, how about you acknowledge me? You know, how about we acknowledge each other? We're acknowledging land, you know? So hopefully acknowledging each other, you know, it, along our learning journey in, in terms of tackling these, these big things together I think that the, the, the summary is I just want to say thank you for the work that you're engaged in, um, you know, working in, the, working in the arts and or working with youth. It's important to acknowledge each one of you on the call today for that work in a spirit of hopefully, you know, uh, shifting culture and doing all the things we talked about today. Thank you, Alberto. Um, I also believe kindness is a strategy. Um, and with that spirit of gratitude, I want to thank Jeff and Alberto and uh, Ashraf for your wisdom and your time and your and your generosity of thought. Um, I want to thank Nadia for being an amazing co-host and, uh, and thought partner and GIA in general for being incredible partners and supporters of this work, creating a platform for us to talk about this. I think the answer to my question might be, we just need more communities of practice. We just need more spaces to engage and, and explore outside of the comfort zone to, to borrow from that final image that you showed, Jeff. Um, and so I think Cultural Policy Action Lab seeks to do that in large and small ways. And we couldn't do it without GIA support. We couldn't do it without incredible um, uh, brilliant partners and practitioners like Alberto and uh, Jeff and Ashraf. And we couldn't do it without the folks that keep coming and contributing back to this work. So please join us again. Uh, on August 17th. Um, thanks to Celine for coming in and being an amazing tech and, and coming in uh, at, at the 11th hour. We, we couldn't have done this without you. Um, thanks to Jen and Estrella, wherever they are this week. This is their baby as well. Um, so deep gratitude to all of you for being here. Deep gratitude to the presenters and deep gratitude to Grantmakers in the Arts who makes this all possible. Have a wonderful Wednesday. <laughs>